grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a joy to welcome you to another edition of Sunday Next Day, where we take bits and pieces of our Sunday service and we put them out there on the internet in the week that follows, so that hopefully, if you were not able to join with us in the sanctuary at Four Corners Community Chapel, you're able to join with us here and that you are able to feel some of that Holy Spirit reaching out through the ministry, through the Word of God, through the music, reaching out to you, to draw you in, to draw me to you and us together. A couple of things that I want to share with you about some of the going-ons at Four Corners Community Chapel in Cumberland these days. Starting this coming Sunday, we're going to be uh, rotating our worship space every other week for the month of September and October. That means that this coming Sunday, September 5th, we're actually gonna be meeting outdoors for worship. We're gonna be meeting on the back lawn uh, of our parsonage. And on the 12th, we'll be meeting indoors. And on the 19th, we'll be meeting outdoors and so on and so forth. Our hope is that this will give us a chance uh, to be able to meet and to enjoy the beauty of God's outdoor sanctuary but may also be an opportunity for some who are not comfortable or able to gather inside to still be able to come and gather in person with the community on those weeks when we are outside. Just a reminder that on weeks when we are indoors, we are requiring face masks to be worn so that we can do our part to keep each other safe. When we are gathering outdoors, no face masks are required and we are also excited to be able to sing together uh, during those outdoor services. On September 19th, we will also have a blessing of the backpacks for our children. So we are inviting you to come with your backpack to church that day, your school backpack, or maybe you're an adult who has a work backpack and you wanna bring it that day. We've got a gift to give you that you can attach to your backpack and carry as a blessing throughout this coming school year. On that same day, we will begin a new year of Sunday school and our director of children's ministry, Amanda Ioko, is excited to welcome our children uh, K through five, uh, back into our Sunday school ministry for another year. Look for more information on our website and through email about that. This morning we gather uh, to be able to worship God and to be able to be together. Um, and I invite you through this time and through this online worship experience uh, to take some rest for your body, for your soul, and for your mind. Uh, may this time together uh, be a gift and a blessing to you as you are to God's whole world. Welcome in, my friends, peace and grace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Come thou font of every
to grace, how great a debt or daily I am called to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Our scripture lesson today comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 and 15, and verses 21 through 23. Let us hear God's word together. Now when the Pharisees and some, of, and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. I've always loved books and had a lot of them. When I was 26, graduating seminary, and I thought my job in the world was to be a great preacher, the most populated shelf in my study was a shelf with biblical commentaries. When I was 30 and traveling to the Middle East, and I thought my job was to change the world, I had a whole shelf that was full of books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Lately, as I try to accept more and more that I also have a responsibility to be changed for the world, I am seeing more books on race and white privilege and on the power of kinship. The older I get, however, the more I just want to love the world. And so the fullest shelf in my study now belongs to a variety of prayer books. The New Zealand prayer book, a Scottish prayer book from 1908 in which the Psalms are all written in rhyme a collection of prayers by the Persian poet Hafez. And one of my favorite prayer books, a go-to for me, is called Gorillas of Grace, Prayers for the Battle by Ted Loder. In that book, one of the prayers goes like this. O God of timelessness and time, I thank you for my time and for those things that are yet possible and precious in it. Daybreak and beginning again, Midnight and the touch of angels, the taming of demons and the dance of dreams, a word of forgiveness and sometimes a song for my breathing, my life. Thank you, O God, for work which engages me in an internal debate between right and reward, 
and stretches me to a responsibility to those who pay for my work and to those who cannot pay because they have no work. For justice, which repairs the devastations of poverty. For liberty, which extends to the captives of violence. For healing, which binds up the broken-bodied and broken-hearted. For bread broken for all the hungry of the earth. For good news of love, which is stronger than death. And for peace, for all to sit under fig trees and not be afraid. For my calling, my life, I give you thanks, O Lord. Amen. For work that engages me and stretches me to heal and bind and become broken bread. I might regret saying this, but I want to work. More and longer and harder if necessary. Right now, we might dismiss this notion as foolishness. For who wants to do work, let alone more of it? Work's a slippery word these days. In our American culture, the average work week I read not too long ago is now considered six days, not five. 60 hours, not 40. And most workers do not use their yearly allotted vacation time. So who needs, let alone wants, to do more work? In the state of Rhode Island, the daily minimum wage is now $11.50 which means the average worker who puts in 40 hours a week making minimum wage must work two and three quarter jobs just to stay in the middle of the pack of average wage earners. Who wants to work like that? And then there is what goes on inside the church. Who wants to work in church? Isn't the whole point of going to church and being part of the Sunday crowd to rest and not work? Isn't the message of Sabbath that it's right for us to put down our tools, if only to see that the world will not fall down without us holding it up? This is not our world. This is God's world, we proclaim. And he's got the whole thing in his hands. So who wants to work? I would guess not you, and not me. And yet, yes, me. I want to work. For that which engages me and stretches me to heal and to bind until I, until we, become broken bread. But I'm concerned that there are fewer and fewer workers available these days. Hold that thought for a moment. Today there are as many as six possible scripture passages that I could have preached on, and they all had to do with work. From James chapter 1. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. It's such simple wisdom that it's often lost on people like me who are always trying to come up with the right thing to say. But James says, if you want to know what the right thing to say is, you must first know what you've heard. And that means being slow to speak and quick to listen. You see, James assumes that we are not out there just trying to hear the sound of our own voice. So be quicker to listen than you are to speak. Otherwise, you're only as useful as a radio in an empty room. You're all talk and no heart, working hard for nothing. On the other hand, says James, true and pure religion is to care for widows and orphans in their distress. In James's world, as in ours, there were a lot of widows and orphans. They had no money, no home, no future, and public opinion was that they were empty goods. Their last hope was to fall down in desperation on the front steps of the church, to crawl up under the side of the tent in search of revival. But sadly, in James's world, as in ours. They too often had to settle instead for a sermon with some nice words about how God has a plan for your future, even though we're sorry you're starving today. So James writes, you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen and slow to speak. And then there's the passage from Mark's gospel, which Phil Avigne read for us today. 
in which Jesus says, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. Jesus is speaking with a group of people who are over the top when it comes to cleanliness. I mean, they wash every cup and pot, every fork and spoon, scrubbing each one ten times just in case what already looks clean to them isn't really clean. Talk about putting in a lot of work. For them, it's a question of what if. What if we missed a spot? What if our best efforts are not good enough and someone, especially God, notices? For this group of Jews, they believe in a one-shot God. One shot, one miss, that's all you've got, that's it. And so they have staked their lives and their reputations on cleanliness. The thing is, though, you've got to be careful because it's possible to take your work too far. For these super healthy, clean, high moral Jews, they have allowed their good habit to become a point of pride and exclusivism. Now, when they sit down at the table, if someone's hands aren't as clean as they think they should be, they start to think that the problem isn't just with the hands, but with the heart. Next thing you know, their disgust with dirty cups today is a disgust with dirty people tomorrow. Put another way, Jesus wants to make clear that you can put all the best stuff into becoming the smartest, strongest, most hardworking individual the world has ever known. But in the end, if you can't stomach the fact that God loves us all, starting with the dirtiest people first, then you are not as clean or smart or as strong as you think you are. None of us are. But we are loved. I said towards the beginning of this sermon that I want to become engaged in work that stretches me to heal and to bind until I, until we, become broken bread. But I'm concerned that there are fewer and fewer workers available these days. I've heard some say that the reason for this has to do with COVID, that we're just all so exhausted by talk of pandemic. We don't want to wear masks anymore, not in school, not in church, not anywhere. And when all this is over, when things are normal again, then we'll get back to work. I've heard others say that the reason that we're lacking for workers is because the problems of the world are just too great for us right now. War in Afghanistan, earthquakes in Haiti, flooding in Tennessee, wildfires out west, the list goes on and on. And when the needs are so many, it's hard to know where to begin in meeting them. It could also just be that on account of our polarization and bipartisanship, we have quite simply forgotten what Mother Teresa once said, we belong to one another. I'd like to leave you with one last thought. The week before last, I got to spend a day working in our community with 20 of our middle and high school students. Under the spirited guidance of Wade Richmond, Kevin Perry, Kara Burns, and Lori Azofsky, we spent a morning at Franklin Farm in Cumberland picking peppers, beans, and eggplants, all of which will go as donations to our local food pantry. And in the afternoon, we helped out at the Providence Rescue Mission, a shelter for the homeless in Providence. We were supposed to spend about four hours at the rescue mission cleaning and painting, but it turned out they had only about 90 minutes worth of work for us to do. And as you can imagine, this was both a bit frustrating and disappointing for the group. Later that evening, when we were in Narragansett, we were sitting around a campfire reflecting on our day. And as these things tend to go, we began to compare our two experiences, like we were trying to decide between them. Which one, the local farm or the local shelter, gave us more opportunity to really make a difference? Which one gave us a chance to meet some people whose lives are really different from our own? Which one would we go back to and help out again? Father Greg Boyle reminds us that this can happen, that there is a gap which exists between the service provider and the service recipient. One is a position of power, privilege, and influence, and the other is not. And that it is only the service provider who, in the end, 
gets to evaluate their experience and decide if it was or was not what they wanted it to be. The irony, of course, is that the service provider may end up judging their experience based not on what they provided to it, but on what it provided to them. The trick, says Father Boyle, is to close this gap. To do our work in such a way that we begin to see ourselves as being in kinship with one another, as belonging to one another, so that there is no longer a service recipient and a service provider. For we are all service recipients and service providers. In the end, the general consensus on the part of our group was that we wished our time at the rescue mission had felt more productive. Until one of the youngest in our group spoke up to say, maybe it was. Maybe it was. Maybe it doesn't matter how long we were there or how much we did, because maybe the point they said was just to show up. To say, here we are, together with you and you with us, a blessed community of kinfolk. God of timelessness and time, I thank you for my time and for those things that are yet possible and precious in it, for work that engages me and stretches me to heal and bind until we all together become broken bread. Amen. May the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you, be with you, and keep you, now and forevermore. Amen.